Welcome to the Molecular Moments Podcast. In today's episode, we sat down with our guest, Dr. John Smiraglia, Vice President and Head of Translational Biomarkers and Bioanalysis at UCB. John is a pharma leader with experience on the development and service side of the industry. He spent a significant chunk of his career on the East Coast, West Coast, and in Europe. Everyone who knows him knows that he's an outstanding scientist, an inspiring leader, and an all-around great guy. Today, we got to hear about his career and the insights he brought from it. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation as much as I did. We are talking science as scientists do. So without further ado, here's another episode of Molecular Moments. Welcome to the podcast, John. I'm delighted to have you join me today. Can we start with you just giving us a few highlights from your career? Hey, Chad. Thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks for this invite. I think it's it's great to have this discussion. Really looking forward to it. I came into this uh, area of business really through working in clinical laboratories and working in hospitals. So my, my first qualification, the first sort of delving into analytical science was really working in hospital facilities, a place that was a drugs abuse center in London. And in that role, it got a chance to use lots of different technologies, things like GCMS, LCMS, a whole range of ligand binding assays. So really, that's where it started for me back, oh gosh, now almost 30 years ago. I was going to ask, actually, you know, not to date you, but I was curious because you talk about some of the large molecule technologies. Uh, and so I was going to ask how long ago that was. So early 90s, I guess, huh? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. I did my, when after my first degree, I sort of uh, got stuck into working in the hospital labs and working in clinical chemistry. And I just had that great opportunity I mentioned. I can remember turning up in the UK, getting qualified in the US, and then having to restart my whole training. My supervisor at the time was a Glaswegian. And I must admit, that was a sort of a entry uh, that I, I wasn't expecting, meaning I could barely understand that two words that he said, but somehow we sort of muddled through. And it was it, I learned a heck of a lot very early days, which was, which was fabulous to me. But as I said, it was really a range of analytical techniques, all kinds of different things. So that's where it all sort of started for me. As you know, I'm sort of born in the U.S., born in New Jersey, but actually, despite the at that time, a reasonable pharma sector in New Jersey. I've actually never worked in New Jersey as such in the pharma industry, which is, I always think is a funny story considering the travels that I've done, uh, both in terms of, as you mentioned, in Europe and on the West Coast and the Midwest and a range of other places. Okay, so I got that wrong, actually. I assumed that you'd work in the Huntington site in New Jersey, but maybe that didn't even exist back then. I don't know. Yeah, you know, it did exist, but I, at that time I had made the move over to the UK. So, um, and, and therefore I was actually working at the Huntington site in Cambridgeshire in the UK. But you're absolutely right. The What was referred to as the Princeton Research Center had been established by then. So it was peculiar that I was the American over in, in, the, in Europe, in the UK, despite the fact that that facility was probably about 20 minutes down the road from where I live and grew up, which, uh, again, it's one of these little funny stories. How did you land in the UK then? During my first degree, I took the opportunity to do an internship where I effectively held back many of my electives and decided to take a uh, semester in the UK. And I um, did that via this exchange program where I was in Worcester, which is sort of at the west side of the country. And, and that was really just about broadening culture, doing some, prior to going to school there in the summer months, I did an interrail throughout Europe. Just again, because I held back many of my electives, I was able to just utilize those for, and without affecting my core curriculum, if you like, as a medical technologist. So that was fun as well. I got a chance to play a lot of sports and a bit of rugby, a bit of football, a bit of or soccer, I should say. And uh, I did enjoy playing basketball because uh, while I was never a talented basketball player, somehow my level was a little bit different than some of the Europeans at the time. So it sort of it builds you with confidence, <laughs> despite I was no better. Nonetheless, it was good fun. It's like the Europeans coming to the U.S. to play soccer. Still, it's uh, it's it's just a different it's just a different level certainly where they're coming from. So, you, when I think about bioanalysis and kind of the the more pharma focused career, you landed first at Huntington. And were you doing bioanalysis at Huntington then in in those uh, years? Yeah, very much. I was a real first uh, focused role in bioanalysis, and I joined as mentioned earlier Huntington Life Sciences. And in that role, I joined as a staff scientist. Um, and my, my, my first uh, job arriving there, and it probably dates me as well, 
was actually to go into the lab and help take apart a massive magnetic sector mass spectrometer. The computer deck alone, the computer system alone was, you know, sort of a bank of computers that was probably about 12 feet long. So it just goes to show how, how the times have changed. But the interesting thing about that was, of course, I could dig into all the intricate nuances of a mass spec, and I'll probably learn more as an entry point by doing that than almost anything else. But that was the time when SciX came out with their platforms and the sort of uh, the API threes and these sorts of things. So, you know, again, different from this today, but, but learned a lot very quickly, as you do in, in CROs oftentimes. Get exposed to lots of different molecules, lots of different structures, and I was able to just sort of get stuck in and had the opportunity to really learn a lot, learn my craft. But it was very much in quantitative bioanalysis. At that point, it was focused on small molecules primarily. But I'd obviously had all that training in the large molecules previously. And I did that for a number of years, really enjoyed the role, was fortunate enough to work with some great people and a number of different important mentors in my career. One particularly is a gentleman called Howard Hill, who was known quite well in Europe. And he really gave me a lot of opportunity and I learned a great deal from him. And, and you know, during that time, I went up to ultimately lead that group. So I forget how long it was, but before leaving Huntington, I was heading up their bioanalytical group there doing work for you know, clients all over, all over the globe, which meant that I... By that point, not only to have the depth of science and work with a number of great colleagues, but it kind of gives you a different view on the business side as well. Because obviously, in terms of you know efficiency, sample throughput, data understanding, working with clients, uh, I got a chance to do a great deal of that, which was again was was also very enjoyable. But by the time I, um, I guess about 2001 turned around, I had decided that I fancied I was looking for a new opportunity, and so with that. There was a now friend and, and a, a sort of someone I had worked with previously who informed me of a role in pharmacy in Chicago or in Skokie, Illinois, what was the former J.D. Searle company. And I uh, took the opportunity to go over there. Was that Doug Fast? Was he there at that time? Doug was certainly there. I, I didn't know Doug at that point. It was a UK um, a gentleman called uh, Ray Briggs. Oh, I knew, um, I know Ray. Yeah, I also know Ray. Small world, right? I think we all sort of connect. <laughs> it is a small world. I yeah. In different ways, uh, Ray was looking for someone to go over to and join what was the clinical pharmacology organization. Now working outside the lab, building bioanalytical strategies, some biomarker work there. The first job I had there was to take on a, a biologic, which was funny enough, I purchased in uh, on a partnership with actually the company I work for now. So the company, uh, Simsia, as a molecule, my first foray into working with that was many years ago, as I say, about 2000, 2001, doing validations and driving, working with CROs, working with people like Doug, who did a lot of the method development work. It's funny how things come full circle. Some 13, 14 years later, when I land at UCB, the first thing I see on my desk is one of my old validation reports from back in the day. So it was, it was just very interesting how you know times change, but things stay very much the same. And I could, I could also see where maybe I would have done things differently if I had all the knowledge that I gained in that period of time as well. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny how those things come around. I actually did an interview with a with a pharma company at one point, and they had acquired a drug that I had worked on uh, in my CRO life. And when I went into the interview, the, the gentleman that interviewed me kind of tossed the validation report in my face and said, well, why don't you just tell me about this? <laughs> so that was kind of the interview. Yeah. I, won't, I won't name who, maybe uh, maybe another time uh, yeah. offline, I'll tell you who, but uh, but it was it was quite an experience and I didn't get the job, so I, I don't know what that means, but uh, Actually, I had no idea you were at Searle, but that was a good group there with Doug and you and Ray Briggs. And then you ended up at Pfizer. And I, and I don't know if you recall, but th I think that's where we first met was when you were at Pfizer. I'm really fascinated now because I feel like I'm learning a lot about your background. I didn't know. How did you end up out in San Diego? Of course, I was with Pharmacia, but Pharmacia was purchased by Pfizer. And so with that, um, and this is only a year down the road. In fact, I left, planned to leave the UK, and the announcement of the acquisition was literally a week before I was planned to leave to the UK. 
So effectively, I joined the organization with probably a little bit of uncertainty and think about moving my whole family, or then my wife and myself, over to the, back to the U.S. But everything works out well. You know, everything worked out very well. So effectively, joining Phar then Pharmacia, uh, got working with a number of great colleagues there as well. And with the purchase of Pharmacia by Pfizer, they had decided to so consolidate certain areas and they closed down the facility that was in Skokie. I had the good fortune that I had options to go off to Michigan and to Ann Arbor or to Groton, Connecticut at that time, or even they were willing to have conversations about going back to the UK if I wished to. The other option was San Diego. And when you're sitting there and it's February and there's 12 inches of snow outside and you're sitting and you're looking across at the, at the golf and you see that you know there's guys worn around in t-shirts on tory pines i think it sort of it made it it made the sales job to my wife very pretty straightforward shall i say right, right. Um, so we so we made that move we made the move over again just one year later to the facility that was formerly agron but effectively that's and that's you're right absolutely that's where we met doing a very similar role sitting in a clinical pharmacology organization leading by analytical strategies working on molecules but also at that point it was there was an opportunity to build a group there so there was just myself and another colleague when I uh, arrived and because we transitioned to be the oncology center it really opened up other opportunities. And then what I mean by that is really then there was a need to bring in the biomarker component there. So some immunohistochemistry the chemistry work, some proteomics were, we were working on at the time as well, and a range of different peptides and proteins. And so I, I had the good fortune of developing a job, being involved in developing Sutent, which was at least one of their key oncology products that they brought in. And yeah, and I forgive me, but I expect I was there for about seven or eight years, if I remember correctly. A couple of colleagues that I was working with in Chicago went over to San Diego as well. So I had a, a soft landing in terms of people there and, and lifestyle. I have to admit, I've wondered, you know, being a New Jersey guy and, and sort of uh, just the Northeast and direct, uh, being perhaps a little more direct in some cases, how would I settle in on the West Coast? Uh, and or you know, but it, it really worked out well, and I, I just love my time there. There's very few places I think where you can pursue you know, your career and do all the you know in a very highly enriched sort of community, but also realize that you can just go out and it people come to that area part of the country for a vacation, and you know the the, the weather's virtually always fine. So I had a great time there, really. But in the end, I sort of decided to pull back to the UK, especially as we had children. By that point, it was quite strong. Something came up whereby I could go back, and perhaps the key trigger here was I was sitting in a clinical pharmacology organization, not necessarily linked to the technology as much as I had been in the past, and I really wanted more of that. I wanted more of being linked to what was really at, at the coalface, and so I went back to the sandwich. I got an invite to take up a role in sandwich in the UK, and I was heading up the binding local effort for a DMPK or PDM organization, as they referred to it. And again, doing some regulatory work, some non-regulatory work, and it was a great opportunity, a, a different type of opportunity, but it sort of filled my passion to still be linked to novel technology development while also being in the, at the project facing activities. Yeah, that was a beautiful facility that Pfizer had in Sandwich in an interesting part of the UK. And your career sort of, I can't say it mimics pharma, but moving around uh, acquisitions, consolidation the shifting of the industry and, and just kind of going with the flow, certainly, uh, you know, your career is certainly reflective of that because then you ended up back in a CRO, back back at Huntington, I guess, for a little while before UCB. Yeah, I did. So the, with uh, the closure of the sandwich facility, I was kind of left wondering what I would do. And I, I referred to someone earlier named Howard Hill. He was still at Huntington. They were looking for someone to come in and help them out. And I thought, well, let's take up the opportunity. I know the people there. I know the organization. And, you know, and I had an enjoyable time. But however, I think one of the things that was interesting about that role, that I was heading up the bioanalytical effort, but I was also heading up the clinical pathology activities. So kind of going back in some respects to all that stuff that we spoke about in the, in the earlier part of the conversation around my first training, what that allowed for is again that that and it really speaks to where I am today as well is the core bioanalytics small molecule large molecule but also 
diagnostic biomarkers, predictive uh, markers of disease, and so on. That was also part of my past training, and I could bring it all together. So that, I think that was one of the things that appealed to that. But um, did that for some period of time, as a, a short time, in fact, about a couple of years or so. This opportunity came up at UCB. Ultimately, I arrived at UCB back in 2013. But I think that pull had a lot to do with still being close to technology as I had been, it's a project-facing activity that's somewhat different when you're working in a farmer organization to when you're working in a contract organization. It was really interesting working with small biotechs and uh, virtual companies when I was at Huntington because I was being asked to give advice and thoughts on, you know, which, which I enjoyed. But it wasn't the same depth of understanding about what kind of modalities are they working on? What are the expectations from the chemistry scaffold or for that matter, the antibody technology and the target to target biology? So this opportunity came up, I decided to jump two feet full, uh, all the way in and the difference being it changed things somewhat. I was in the UK by that point, but this took me out to Belgium as well. So in my current role, I'm responsible for a facility in Slough in the UK. So just outside of Heathrow Airport, maybe 20 minutes max. The old cell tech? Correct, yeah, right. exactly. UCB had purchased cell tech probably circa eight or nine years before my arrival. And the cell tech organization was very much a biotech, one of the more successful biotechs in the UK, very much on biologics, very much on focusing in immunology as a disease area, if you like. And I, some might say that's not a disease area, it's a broad cross section of different uh, diseases, but nonetheless, sort of focusing there and of course, that's where Simsia, again, came back onto my desk, but also the facility in Belgium. And that was a whole nother eye opener for me. Belgium is a wonderful place, diversity of culture, great folks, but I don't speak French, nor do I speak Flemish. So it was it's a challenge. And I would, some would say it still remains a significant challenge. Yeah, yeah. So have you learned a little bit on, on either side? Your, your facility would be maybe more French than... Correct. Than... It's in the Wallon region, and that is about 20 minutes from Brussels to the south. The language of the laboratory is definitely French. The language in terms of the official business language is English. So in the conversations outside the laboratory, I was fine. In the conversations inside the laboratory, I, I suspect uh, people were enjoying, you know, the American coming in and they could tell, tell a lot of stories that I would have no idea what they were referring to. But I did learn a lot, I, you know, and I learned some French. I have Italian heritage, and with that, uh, I can just about get by in Italian. So inevitably, that did help somewhat. But uh, I am far, far from being able to speak French. I can get every third word if I'm fortunate, sadly. It's worked out so far. You're like this 100% New Jersey guy that <laughs> hasn't lived there since you were a kid or ever worked there, right? You're Italian, you, you're, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a New Jersey look, but, uh, and I don't mean that <laughs> in a negative way, but uh, if I talked to you on the street, I might've pegged you for New Jersey. Yeah. Although you don't have a strong, I'll say New Jersey accent, right? Uh, you're probably not getting on a Jersey shore, but uh, you seem like a New Jersey guy. And I mean that in all the, in all the good ways, right? The, you know, brilliant soccer players that have come out of there, things like that. But uh, was this all happenstance? Do you kind of have this adventure that you wanted to kind of circulate around all these places? And uh, also, I'm curious with your, you know, what motivated you in the science? So just what made you who you are moving around and all this? I think that piece around moving around just had all to do with curiosity. It had everything to do with meeting new people, diversity of thought, diversity of interactions. I find it incredibly amazing. I have people who've gone through and worked in the same area for some long period of time, but our the filters we put in, the, our understanding that we bring is very different and culture has a lot to do with. So I think that answers that part of it. From the science perspective, you know, I, I was fortunate that at a relatively early age, I sort of really got on with chemistry. It, growing up in New Jersey, as I mentioned, I had an older brother who was uh, going down the biochemistry route. And 
I would never say this to him at the time, but I, I obviously admired him greatly for all that he, you know, where he was going with the things he was doing. He kind of opened my eyes, but, my, but a few teachers that I had back in the high school days sort of really made a difference there. And then I found it makes sense. It works for me. I, I get it. You know, sometimes I not that great on other subjects. Don't put me down testing me in English literature. I'll be, I'm sure I wouldn't do so hot, but uh, it seemed to work out quite well. And so that's really where the, all that started. And then it's just been a bit of a ride. It's been a bit of a ride in terms of the biology understanding. I always think of the work that we do as absolutely knowing chemistry, but also knowing biology. That Those three small letters in the beginning of you know, uh, the work that we do, bioanalysis, is really very important to understand the context and the interpretation. And especially when you think about biologics and where we are with PK and imaginist free and total and imaginicity and characterizing imaginicity in the ways that we do, understanding what that means to the target, what it means to the potential safety risk, it just seemed to land really well. And so with that, I've kind of always carried this. So I've not been the hard card carrying analytical chemist, but more bringing in the biological context along with the analytical chemistry component. And that's really where the passion, you know, comes from. Yeah, well, I think that's so important. And that's, yeah, that's something we've talked about on the, on the business side, right outside of the, uh, of the podcast is, uh, is taking the time to understand the biology and, and answering questions, right? We, we use these tools to answer the questions. And that's one of the things also that I've seen in your lab and your work at UCB, you know, from an outsider looking in, it seems that you kind of came in, you inherited a nice lab and a nice setup, but you've really made it a facility that can answer those big questions. Is that a fair assessment? And maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, I did. Uh, yes, yeah, somewhat. But I would also say it's really not, I'm not sure how much it was about me. It's about building that team. I had an opportunity to build a team and bring some people in and make some changes. We did make some changes. It's, it's fair to say. At that time, the cell tech company still kind of existed within the culture, and it was separate from the Belgium culture. We were able to bring one bioanalytical organization. And think about that diversity that I crave and I, I enjoy so much, the diversity of scientific thought. We're able to bring the biologics as well as the small molecules together. UCB has a strong pedigree in epilepsy and neurodegenerative diseases. And then you have cell tech with immunology and really strong antibody engine in terms of the uh, antibody, uh, the antibodies that generated. So my current boss, great guy, he was looking for someone to come in and take hold and provide some thoughts. And so we, we built some. So where we're at today is really having have one part of the organization focused primarily on the technologies associated with the biomarkers and its broad spectrum platform. So it's, it's yes, certainly we have mass spectrometry and we have a range of ligand binding tools. Well, what we built on top of that was a flow cytometry group within, as well as more recently, a, an immunistic chemistry offering a new chemistry group within that, focused on the biomarker piece rather than the safety endpoints. Additionally, we built a proteomics and transcriptomics group inside this. And so therefore, I've always been a, a, an advocate of, again, what's the question? And let's find the tool that answers the question rather than driving everything down one particular platform. And then it's up to the biomedical scientists to make that judgment of which tool, which platform is going to be able to truly understand that you may do it in an orthogonal way. You may do it, you may take it to actually go forward with both in some cases, because they give you different answers, if you like. And over this period of time, uh, we've been able to build a really strong group there, some great leaders on, on the site as well. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of in this phase where we've, you know, continued to support the portfolio. We support the portfolio from portfolio entry all the way out to post-marketing activity. So I kind of spoke about the biomarker component. Lots of early, those guys are very much focused on the early questions that we translate through into the clinic. And we do have a, another group, which is the regulatory arm of the group, the regulatory biodiversity group. We did have to transform that a little bit when I joined great scientists who knew a lot about regulatory bioanalysis, but were focused on small molecules. And our portfolio shifted quite a lot to biologics. So effectively, that was a whole nother challenge, an exciting challenge, and it's great the transition that's happened, but that group had not touched a biologic, really. And now, virtually everything they do are biologics. 
UCB in some spaces have been uh, neuroscience focused, right? You mentioned epilepsy, strength, and things like that. One area that I've been curious about is where do we think biologics will go in the neuroscience space, right? There's issues with like crossing the blood brain barrier and, and things like that. So do you see that continuing to grow or is that going to continue to be the domain of small molecules? So I think it's it's a challenge. The blood-brain barrier is the primary challenge, right? And there's a range of different, and people have done work in this field, and we're doing work in this field, about how do we transport into the blood-brain barrier, right? Through the blood-brain barrier, I should say. We look at different modalities. We look at different antibody framework to try and see if we can get more through. I think we'll continue to do that, but it's fair to say that if you look at our portfolio and others' portfolio in terms of biologics, you're really putting a lot on board, really high doses to get enough into the brain and, and managing all that. Having said that, of course, that, that and that probably speaks to, again, some transitions that's happening in the industry. UCB is ways of, of dealing with that is looking at novel modalities. Are there modalities that can take us that may not be antibodies as such, maybe some, uh, some version of an antibody, but also then we've gone heavily, invested heavily in gene therapy in neuroscience specifically to avoid, and the delivery systems obviously being very different there. And that's a whole nother area. I, I, I must admit, I'm learning every day. I'm learning from a lot of great colleagues because it's, it's not a, an area that I had particularly done a great deal of work in previously, but over the last few years, we've built a, you know, a, a reasonable portfolio for the company that we are, the size of company that we are. I think that partially to address this component of overcoming from a delivery perspective. And the other part to, I guess, that equation that I was alluding to from a technology perspective, we're now building a gene therapy laboratory as part of the bioanalytical organization. So bioanalyticals is this very large umbrella with lots of different technologies, lots of different scientists. I just had a conversation today with a colleague, and it, I think is amazing to see each of the leaders who were speaking in different areas all came at the problem from very different places. Again, that diversity that stimulated me was bore out in this conversation. And they found it you know, very positive because they could see from a different perspective onto the challenges they were facing. But I think as far as we will still remain challenged by getting sufficient drug on board in the brain through blood-brain barrier or otherwise. Just a call it a public service message, but for anybody who's listening that's curious about gene therapy, I talked to Laura Sepler and Zeno a couple of weeks ago on my podcast, and she uh, she's the chief scientific officer at Intellia Therapeutics and did probably the best simple explanation of gene therapy. So we'll leave it at that, gene therapy versus gene editing, and it was fantastic. So John, probably you at this point understand that piece, but for others who might be curious, that'd be a good a good point of reference. You know, the other thing I was thinking as you were talking is that you started out in clinical pathology, probably didn't see a flow cytometer, a qPCR, immunohistochemistry for 20 years, and now those are becoming common tools in bioanalytical laboratories, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. And that's been just so exciting, really, because it, it was going back to so many years, you know, having to develop those kind of assays many years ago, and just the, the fundamental knowledge that was established early days has paid dividends and really has helped me to, you know, to think in the way that I do. And so, yeah, all of a sudden, again, all those things that I'd done 20, 30, almost 30 years ago now are back with me you know, today. And I'm just uh, always surprised by that. And now we're trying to think of how do you validate a flow cytometry assay to the standards of a, of a mass spec or an ELISA? How do you validate a qPCR assay? So those are interesting questions on the on the regulatory side, we're going to continue to ask ourselves. Uh, one of the other things you had told me about not too long ago was that you had had to transform your lab to do some COVID testing. Yeah. I'm sure it was a huge amount of work, not what was in your plan, but also an opportunity, right, to help the country. Oh, it was an incredible time. It, really difficult because why we had to do it. But incredible. And I must admit, I, I mean, I've always, I've just had a great time at UCB and really the people there really enriched my life. But we came to a situation where everybody, as all of us were in with COVID and rates going up, the Belgian government was looking for companies to help support testing. And because of my former diagnostic background, it was known to one of the leaders in the organization, ah, and they were approached by the government and said, oh, we might have somebody who can help. And I thought, okay. And I, I remember that day when my boss came to me and said, got a challenge for you. 
effectively it was to help build this diagnostic PCR laboratory where we had nothing previously. We have research colleagues working on PCR as a technology. We have some, you know, good experts in that. And it effectively was converting a laboratory that wasn't being utilized because of the COVID circumstances, people not being on site as often, and working with some great partners and great colleagues to really build a consortium of different approaches. Some people came from a toxicology background. Others came from a research therapeutic area background. Establish a core team to then make sure we met all the appropriate quality standards for a diagnostic light. So effectively, in I think it was in two weeks, we had built this laboratory and got the approval to run that specific assay as a diagnostic offshoot of KU, a laboratory, a clinical laboratory. And so I, I was very proud of that. And I was very proud of the colleagues because it was all about everybody pitching in, everybody coming together. And so we did exactly that. And we did thousands upon thousands of tests per day. And people were there committing to arriving early in the morning, 6 a.m., and some staying on very late into the evening just to get the job done. And it, the beauty of it was the passion people, they wanted to do something for common good. And I was really so proud to be at UCB who commit, allowed us that opportunity, but the people that I worked with, it was just tremendous. It was difficult. You know, I always pride myself on working hard, doing my best I can do. And I had never come close to working to such exhaustion. I can remember my wife would have a laugh about this, but I, I would literally move down into my office and we had a sort of uh, pull-out bed. And like, there were days I never left that room because we were working day and night, running out to midnight, getting a couple hours, going back again, just to get to this place. And it was, now it's incredibly rewarding. At the time, it was exhausting. It truly was exhausting. But we did this, we supported the company, and it allowed the country to transition to a better and more robust platform. We were able to go in and address the immediate need. We're all about patient value and trying to bring benefit to patient. And that is a great example of that culture that says, you know what, this is not our natural domain. We're not a diagnostic lab, but we use the skills we have to actually do something that's going to make a difference to people's lives. And that's the part of the work that we do that drives me, that makes me feel like, you know, I go in the morning and I feel so great about what we do. I've had some really great opportunities here at UCB, working in oncology, you're, you're very close to the patient and the patient experience as well. I think it's that. So, and we did that for, I would say the bed part of about nine or 10 months before they can get a more stable platform in the country. That's a cool story. And, and of course, I asked you to speak about that at the Land of Lakes bioanalytical meeting. So I'm looking forward to kind of hearing some of the details here and some of the analytical details and it had to just felt great just to contribute, as you said, right? Where we love what we do. We know we contribute to human health, but so often those uh, impacts are 15 years down the road. So it's hard to feel the immediate impact. So congratulations and thanks for that. I wanted to talk a little bit about more of the extracurriculars related to science. I know you're really involved in EBF and you've been involved in AAPS. I just talked about your speaking at the Land of Lakes meeting this summer. Can you just talk about some of those different activities you're involved in and why and how that impacts our industry? Yeah, I've always been a strong proponent. This goes back to those HLS days of actually sitting down scientist to scientist, having chats, having discussions. My favorite meetings are, are often sometimes the smaller meetings where you can get into the depth and you can, get into, and you can have those conversations like Land of Lakes or if the, the Reed Forum in the UK is also one that's like this. They're residential meetings. And just as often as you're speaking in a auditorium, you're speaking over a coffee in the morning or a glass of uh, wine in the evening, and you really get the chance to meet and get to know your colleagues that are not necessarily sitting right next to you in your in the organization. So, so being in Europe, the EBF came up, and you know, there's a group of people who really built that. When I was when I came back to before that, it really established when I was in. The U.S. Around 2008 or something, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. By 2008, I was obviously already in the U.S., so I was not overly active right at the start. But then when I came back, that's when EBF was building its biologics arm, if you like. And I was one. Of, I think I was there at the, one of the first meeting, and I still have great friends and colleagues who were sitting in that meeting at that time. You know, and I'm still connected with them. We're still talking science today. I stayed within that, got to know people there, was able to do some work 
focused on a couple of areas like microsampling and done a lot of work in that community and do some uh, drives, get some publications out. I'm very impressed by that organization in terms of what they've been able to build in such a short time. And always been a proponent, always been one who valued those conversations. Invariably, it's not just the large meeting they have each year, but it's also the smaller meetings they have throughout the year. And so um, constantly supported that, constantly supported colleagues in my organization to attend as well, because I knew I gained so much from it. AAPS, I was certainly was involved more often when I was in the U.S. than I am now, but nonetheless, attend every couple of years or so where I can. I'm looking forward to that opportunity. I'm looking forward to Lend Lakes. It's been a few years since I've been there. So that's another one that's exciting to me. But there's also, you know, I sit on the board or I did sit on the board of the European Immigency Platform. And again, that was a, another sort of really strong group of scientists focused on immunogenicity, focus on, you know, cell-mediated response. And, and I, I always think that it's part of my job is to bring in science from outside and challenge ourselves and challenge our thinking by gaining from the relationships built within the community. And that's, I've been a strong proponent of that. So I, I've always uh, felt that that was the right thing to do. And fortunately, my company supports that, which is great. Yeah, it's exciting. EIP, you mentioned that I went for my first time. Well, it was last year, right, right before COVID. So I was uh, fortunate to attend, and I heard heard it was a great meeting again this year. So that's uh, that that is another uh, another big meeting uh, that you mentioned. So you mentioned Howard Hill. Howard is somebody certainly, if you've been around bioanalysis for a while, he was maybe one of the I don't know if I could call him a grandfather, one of the pioneers in sort of modern bioanalysis, along with a few other folks. He was a mentor to you. Can you talk more about maybe other mentors or, or Howard's mentoring and, and how you've sort of tried to carry on that legacy in, in your current roles? Yeah, I'll touch base a little bit more on Howard. Again, he just he offered that opportunity. He, I think one of the reasons that he was willing to give a guy a shot, right? So he was willing to say, let's, you know, and, and, and through that, I learned so much. And I think that's something that I carry through today as well. I think part of my role today is to make opportunities for young scientists to, to understand what we do. To get the, They may go in and build a whole career in bioanalysis. They may do it for a short time and find it's not right for them. But I think that's a really important uh, opportunity. It, as far as other mentors, I mentioned this shift that went, and, and this is probably a little bit outside the bioanalytical community, but this shift that went into clinical pharmacology. I had a great opportunity to work with a gentleman called Karosh Parivar, who may not be know, very well known in our community, but he's a very impressive clinical pharmacologist. And I learned so much about the context of what we do by that relationship and working with him. And I had links to him when I was in Chicago. He went over to San Diego. We worked together in San Diego. Because he was a clinical pharmacologist and needed someone to bring bioanalytical content, it allowed open opportunity. And he was willing to if I came up with crazy ideas, at least put them on the table and we'd have a discussion about them. And I think that's really important. And that works well with for me is, hey, no idea is too crazy. Let's get it out there and let's see if it holds water or if it doesn't hold water. So again, a great colleague, my current boss, I, I must admit, he's a very strong legend. He's been really, continues to help me as a coach and mentor in terms of uh, thinking broadly around our community of development scientists. So we're talking about a DMPK organization, a toxicology organization, a clinical pharmacology organization, and the translational biomarker and bioanalysis group. And what I've learned over recent years has much more to do with drug development and how you bring all those disciplines together, besides, of course, still pursuing my career in, in bioanalysis. Again, and I think that sort of goes back to the culture of UCB. Got an idea, put it out there. If it holds water, and, you know, it makes sense, then someone's going to, you'll likely get people to think, let's give it a go. Let's give it a crack. That's partially why we're able to build what we have done. Because if you go back years ago, it was very much a laboratory that was focused on, give me a number of samples and I'll give you some numbers. I'll give you some data. But now we're interacting on eye level with our clinical pharmacologists, with our toxicologists. We have people who are bioanalytical scientists who are leading the entire development program from a development science perspective. So bringing in all those different elements of toxicology and they're responsible to the project team to bring in the contribution from more than 100 people. So I think it's, it's just a, a whole different type of opportunity. 
That is, and that that knowing how pharma works, that's a really unique opportunity for bioanalytical scientists to take more of a leadership role and not just be the guy who gives who gives away some data. But if you get those people with the right opportunities in the right places, then the the whole company is better, and that's that's incredible. I I was going to mention one anecdote, and it's kind of changing here to a couple of fun questions I have for you. But you know, I visited a couple times down in Brain. And of course, I have to admit, I'm not sure if I enjoyed the visit to the lab or the visit to Waterloo, because <laughs> we stayed at the uh, the hotel that's right there at Waterloo. And I remember sure. uh, getting getting up at like five o'clock in the morning so I could see Waterloo before we went and, uh, and visited the uh, the facility at the uh, at Brain. But that's kind of cool, some cool history right there in your backyard. But uh, John, I wanted to ask a couple of fun questions, if you don't mind. Maybe <laughs> try to see if we can get to know you a little better. So. Uh, New Jersey guy, Springsteen or Bon Jovi and why? Oh, wow. There you go. A big Springsteen man. Uh, I'm the kind of guy who, when I was a kid, be out there looking, getting tickets, I'd be on the line at midnight to make sure I was, you know, in, in the beginning of the line to get tickets when he was in the Meadowlands or some of those places. So, you know, I was a bit kooky that way, uh, but I was quite happy to do that. So, yeah, where I grew up, Springsteen was just down the road. So literally Freehold, where he's from. What probably 20 to 30 minutes from where I sort of have many of my formative years. Bon Jovi was just down the uh, down the line in in Saraville as well, so not very far. However, my best friend is is definitely a Bon Jovi guy, and so we would we'd have a few laughs uh, over that one. But yeah, I still I still listen to Springsteen. I was doing some work out here, and you know I had the Springsteen crank, and even even despite it's whatever you know a heck of a long time since some of that music first came out. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. But uh, I'm with you. I think I would go Springsteen as well uh, over Bon Jovi. So, all right, I'm going to throw a couple more at you. So uh, what's your favorite meal? You a breakfast, lunch, or dinner guy? I'm a dinner guy, I'd say. Yeah, I'm kind of keen. I'm also a keen cook. So I'd like to just, uh, you know, experiment and do my do some chemistry in the, in the, in the kitchen. And uh, I do a lot of uh, sort of uh, cooking. And, and yeah, I'm definitely, what's my favorite meal? Oh gosh, uh, I think you know for like lunchtime meals, it's something like a pizza's great. It's, it goes back to Italian, Italian heritage, right? So maybe something like an awesome buco or something along those lines. Yeah, uh, yeah. I grew up on that food. It's it's part of who I am, and so I just love uh, all kinds of Italian food. You're making me hungry. It's almost lunchtime here, and you're probably uh, waiting for dinner. One one more question for you. So uh, to to end on, do you do you have any uh, advice uh, that you would want to leave, or or a motto that you live by? Uh, that you might uh, share with everyone before we close out? Yes, yeah, so I suspect that it's two things that link back to our earlier conversation. One uh, links to the need to just give yourself the space to put the work in. You learn so much, you develop so many ideas and thoughts, and the diversity of thoughts when you're working with different people is really something that has held me in very good stead. It's, it made me a far more effective scientist and leader. You know, sometimes you just got to get in there and not be afraid to roll your sleeves up and get it done. And you, and you gain so much through that. So I think it's that one. And the other thing links back to is, and this is really an important motto for me, especially these days, is about giving people opportunities. I was given opportunities. It helped me out tremendously. I'm a real advocate of trying to, you know, bring in students into the laboratory, bring in PhDs into the laboratory, you know, people who may not be sure if bioanalytical is the right career for them, but they're early in the, they've done it for a few years, they get a real taste for it or not. And that's great too, because then that helps them to develop whatever their passions are. So, you know, follow that passion, give it a try. For me, that's been, it's worked out very well and I'm, I'm, I'm loving what I do. John, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to, to do this podcast with you. I know how busy you are. And, you know, I reached out and I said, John, I feel like I'm always reaching out to you to ask for this, ask for that. And, and uh, you're always so gracious. So thank you so much uh, for being on. I appreciate it. Any, any last words you want to offer? Yes, but to say thank you to you. I mean, this is a great little vehicle. I love these these podcasts. They're fabulous. I, love, I was listening into a few of them, and I still I still sort of listen to them from time to time. So it's just my thanks to, to have this conversation. And for me, it's a great opportunity to connecting with with our community in a, in a different way, especially nowadays with COVID being what it is. So uh, I'm still looking forward, Chad, to getting over to meeting face to face as well and having uh, having some more scientific conversations. 
Hey, you bet. And I got vaccinated last week, actually. So uh, hopefully I'll be in, in Europe before too long. I was, I was fortunate. So that's all for this episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app so you never miss a conversation. If you'd like to hang out with us outside of the podcast, we have many webinars and other presentations available for your enjoyment and education. Visit bioagilitics.com to see what's coming up and how you can stay in touch. And don't forget to keep an eye out for more episodes coming soon. We're looking forward to some great guests. We'll have world-renowned experts talking about rare diseases, vaccine experts discussing the next generation of mRNA vaccines, more new and exciting technology experts, and a conversation with a patient who's benefited from the recent tremendous developments in our industry. Molecular Moments would not be possible without the support of our sponsor, Bioagilytics Labs. Bioagilytics is a global contract research organization specializing in large molecule bioanalysis. Based in Durham, North Carolina with labs in Hamburg, Germany and Boston, Massachusetts, Bioagilytics provides high quality bioanalytical services to leading pharma and biotech companies around the world. They offer assay development, validation and sample analysis under non-GLP, GLP and GCP, as well as GMP quality control testing. If you're looking to work with a team of highly experienced scientific and QA professionals through all phases of clinical development, look no further than Bioagilytics. For more information or to speak with their scientists today, visit their website at www.bioagilytics.com. Thanks for listening to the Molecular Moments podcast.